Thank you, everyone, for taking your time to uh, join us on this uh, Data Explorer Town Hall meeting. My name's uh, Jeff Gladstein. I'm the uh, Senior Manager of Cyber uh, Infrastructure here at OOI. And uh, these sort of meetings and, and user feedback is so important to us. Uh, Data Explorer is primarily user driven. So please keep that feedback coming. Uh, we appreciate it very much and we appreciate your uh, support. Before we jump into the demo, I did want to show a screen print of our, our beta function uh, of streaming data. So we've had uh, dashboards and real-time plotting out there of uh, cable data coming into the system where you can uh, view it in a grid or as one large uh, display and you can get to it through uh, the landing page. I don't think we'll get to uh, demo this today, but please go out and uh, take a look when you get a chance. I think it's a very exciting new feature. Uh, as it is uh, beta, it probably will uh, be altered a little bit in the future. With that, I'll hand it over to the demo team of Stacy, Brian, and Mike, and they can introduce themselves as we uh, hand off the uh, presentation here. Let me stop sharing. I think it's over to you, Stacy. Great, thank you everybody for joining. I'm Stacy Bucklew, I'm with Axiom Data Science. Um, we are the data partner to the OOI program. Um, and we've been working the last several years on uh, the web discovery interface for OOI data. Uh, we just recently had a version release. We're on version 1.5 that integrates several new features that we're going to show you today. Um, the features have been added to enhance um, and add new scientific instrument data to the Data Explorer for exploration and download, in addition to add new features as we've heard feedback from the user community on new ways that they would like to discover the data. Um, Brian Stone with our team has been um, acting as the lead for the Data Explorer, and he's gonna walk us through these new features. Um, in addition, Mike Fidaro um, is gonna be joining us um, from the UW team uh, to walk through some specific science use cases for these new data and features. So um, thanks everybody for joining, and uh, we'll be walking through these features, doing some demos, and feel free to um, add comments as we go uh, to the chat box, and then we'll have some open time at the end uh, to hear from you any feedback that you have or any uh, interests, questions, or things that you'd like for us to explore further. Well, Brian, I'll pass it to you. Okay, great. Uh, hopefully everybody can see the OOI homepage. Um, if you want to follow along, it's dataexplorer.oceanobservatories.org, um, and you should see the same thing. Um, so I'm going to do a quick overview um, on navigating the site, and then we'll look at some of the new features that were introduced in the latest release. Um, so homepage here, uh, the nav bar at the top stays here the whole time you're on the site. Um, so any of these links you can access um, anywhere you are on the site. Uh, scrolling down a little bit, um, we have data access. This gets you to a little search widget. Um, you can access the same thing under Access Array Data at the top, and it's a globe and a little search, um, sort of a little search grid, and I'll walk through that really quick. Data views, these are um, pre-created views into um, time series data sets, um, and I believe Mike is going to demo one of those. Um, downloads, this is a way to collect um, downloads for later use. Settings, you can set your units, stuff like that. Share, if you're on a page, you can share your view with another user. Help, there's some nice help resources, including animated GIFs that give you a, um, sort of a walkthrough of how to use different features. And then feedback, this is really useful to us. If you're on a page and you have a question, um, something isn't working, something you especially like, um, you can hit the feedback the state of the page you're on will be shared with us. So it makes us makes it easy for us to troubleshoot. And then you can write a brief description. If you include your name and email, we, we get back to you. Um, rolling down the page a little bit, um, there are some, some links here that sort of repeat some links at the top. But one thing that could be useful for you is um, the portal release notes. 
those are the features that we're going to be walking through today. And, and we've iterated through each of the portal releases. So you can see the evolution of the portal. OK, so I'm going to click on data access. This is just a bigger version of the access array data widget that we looked at earlier. Um, here, there is, let me make sure everything fits. There is a, um, a text box, so you can search for whatever you want. So I could search for air temperature. Um, there's um, each of the locations. So the, these are the different array locations around the globe. You can see they're highlighted as I hover, hover over them. Or if I click on one, um, that array location gets highlighted on the left side. So at this point, the um, drop downs on the bottom have updated with only instrument types, platform types, and parameters that are available at the East Coast um, Coastal Pioneer Array site. So I can either select an area of interest or I can just hit go to go to the array page. So this is an intro to the um, Coastal Pioneer Array. Uh, I can get more information or I can see platforms throughout the site. I can access the platforms by either clicking on the map, the depth plot on the right side, or the name on the left side. Each of those, clicking on any of those takes me to the same spot. And that just dives me deeper. It dives me into one of those locations. Uh, more information gives me some background information on the array, along with a little diagram, and links into the main OOI site. Um, I'm not going to go through each of the other tabs at the top. We'll just look at a couple of them right now. But those give you views into different ways of looking at the data, different ways of sort of slicing and dicing the data, along with um, filters that let you um, narrow it down to just your area of interest. Uh, so the first feature that I wanted to talk about was the autonomous underwater vehicles. We've added AUV data um, for Pioneer. Um, so if I click on this tab at the top, I can see all of the AUV data at Pioneer. Uh, when I first land on this page, I'm going to get uh, automatically selected as the first um, deployment in the, uh, in the list. I can click on different deployments to see preview plots of each uh, of all parameters for that deployment. So you can see we're looking at CDOM, chlorophyll A, conductivity, et cetera. If I hover, I get a little view into the, um, I hear that the sharing is on a delay. Do I need to slow down a little bit? OK, I'll try to take a little more time on screens. Um, if I hover, I get a little more info, information about uh, the profile that I'm on top of, or I can click on the map and see where this um, AUV went. And I can hover over each point to get a little extra information. Um, within this interface, I can also get at AUV data by looking at, if I want to compare it to other data, I can look at parameters. So let's say I'm interested in chlorophyll A, I click on parameters and then click on chlorophyll A. And now I'm seeing all chlorophyll A data across the array. Uh, and if I scroll down, I'll eventually get to some AUV data. So you can see here, we're looking at in situ data, um, glider data, along with the AUV data. Uh, if I click on a AUV data plot, I'm going to get to the detail page. And so at the top, I can get back to that AUV main data page or back to the main Coastal Pioneer page. Or since I'm here, I might as well do some exploring. Um, so at the top on the left, there's a map that shows where the profiles are for, for the AUV. I can hover over that. And let me scroll down just a pitch. As I hover over the plot, um, the location that I'm hovering over is going to highlight in the curtain plot on the right, the 2D plot, uh, and the 3D plot on the bottom. So I can sort of orient myself to where uh, what data I'm looking at. I can do the same thing on the 2D plot here. So now I'm highlighting the map and the 3D plot. Um, I can't hover over the 3D plot, but I can manipulate it. Uh, and you can see that we're looking at sort of a slice of bathymetry with the AUV data. Um, once I've found what I'm interested in, I can download the data um, at the top here, so under downloads. And there are a number of different uh, formats. Uh, 
And then on the left side, I get a little bit extra uh, information. I can see you know, how many points are in this um, deployment, what the date range is. Um, I can see that OOI is the institution. Brian, um, Mary, yeah. Mary Neely has raised her hand. Oh, um, sure. Go ahead, Mary. Oh, it's in Q&A. OK, I will click on that. OK, it sounds like um, station. Oh, OK. How would I download just one or one or two profiles from that example data, uh, AV data set? At this point, you can only download the whole data set. So within that, um, profiles are, are an attribute. And so you could then you know, use whatever program you want to use to filter down to just those two profiles. OK, and Mary also says, how would I? Uh... OK, hopefully folks are seeing live. Um, all that last demo was not live. OK, I'll stick it's, on the stage uh, for it. Just a it's been bit. on kind of a delay for me as well. Okay. Just a little bit behind what you're what you're describing, but it does catch up usually. And Brian, Mary's question is on the main page search, can I use the five character instrument name Flort, Flord, Opta? In the past, this has not worked for me, and it seems easy to add that as a basic search unit. Okay, um, let me just try that. So if I go to data access, so um, I'm not sure if you're referring to the reference designator. It doesn't sound like it, but um, the ref reference designator is searchable. Um, so if I search for Flort, I get, um, you know, I can get 141 data streams as a result. Um, it may be that if I start typing in something else, yeah, even though those two words perhaps exist within the result, um, if they don't happen next to each other, uh, the search isn't going to be able to find those. So it sounds like you're asking if there would be a way to add like an or character. So uh, flort I, or floored. Can, can, can you hear me now? I am. Yeah. I, I had to leave and come back and uh, my screen does look different now. Um, but whatever, again, whatever you're doing live um, is not showing up for me. But yes, that it, that is what I was uh, referring to, the OPTA A or the FLORT or the FLORD. Um, I think there's 85 of them, and it would be great if you could add those to the search because some of us who know what instrument we're looking for, that would be a, a valuable shortcut for us just to cut straight to the data that we want from the instrument okay. that we want. Just yeah, that makes, that makes sense. Let me show you one other feature. I, I'm not sure if it's showing up for you. It sounds like there is a delay. But um, under select areas of interest, there is all of the instruments are listed. And it sounds like you're, are you talking about the fluorometer? Um, so yeah, any of the optical instruments the the um, five, the five character um, designation uh, sort of varies depending upon which specific instrument sensors are on the platform. So that's why it's important. But yeah, fluorometer would be FLORT or FLORD. Okay. So yeah, in this please. case, Oh, go ahead, Jeff. If you use those only, it will work. As Brian said, if you type in something else, it doesn't. It parses out of the reference designator. But we can, uh, so, so are you asking, can you use that by itself or do you want it to be an or? Yeah, yes, I'm asking if I just type in F-L-O-R-T and I that hit enter in the search, will it return all of the F-L-O-R-T data sources for me in that search now, like currently? It, it should. Um, Thank so you. So if I take, yeah, I get 141 data streams back. It may be returning extra just because that particular string might appear in other instances. 
Um, but yeah, if you want to give that a try on your own and submit a feedback, if it's not returning what you want, we can look closer at it. OK, so are there any questions about AUV data? Um, it's similar to glider data, but um, it's, it's a new data type for us. Um, it looks like someone not, was asking about how to download one or two profiles from that example data set. OK, yeah. So within the download, you can only download the whole data set right now. Um, Gliders offers a, a bit more refinement as far as download through the ERDAP interface. But right now, AEV data isn't available in ERDAP. So you would have to download the whole thing and then filter on the, on the profile attribute. OK, so the next feature is um, media, high-resolution camera data. And I believe I'm going to pass the screen over to Mike uh, Vidaro to introduce. OK. Well, hopefully, <laughs> somebody was saying there is no delay if you have a fast enough internet. So hopefully this works. My internet is usually pretty quick, but we will see. All right. So hi, Mike Rodaro. I am part of the uh, University of Washington um, Cable Array data team, um, and I will be demonstrating. Hopefully, you're seeing my screen. Hold on. Zoom is popping up windows for some reason. Um, are you seeing the Data Explorer screen? Yes. We are. OK. Um, right. So uh, yeah, part of the Kevlar Ray data team. I'm going to be showing off some of the new features of uh, imagery and sonar. So uh, like Brian, I'll start with the search field. Um, and I can look for camera or like uh, Mary Beth was saying, I could do CamDS, which is the, the code for the still cameras. Um, but I'll start with camera and then I'll go to the instrument type. Um, oops, I searched on Flort earlier, so it popped up Flort for me. But OK, so now we've got the, the different cameras. And you can choose which camera you want to look at. Um, I am going to start with the Oregon offshore, which is at 600 meters off the shore of Oregon off the coast of Oregon. Um, and this is part of the uh, endurance, the cabled endurance array. You can see the, uh, the most recent ones. We're about to go out and replace these cameras uh, because there's a little bit of biofouling on the lenses here. Um, but if you go back in time, you can see the, the scroll bar at the bottom of the screen. I can pull this down, or I can click and, and quickly go back to the area that I want to go to. Um, but if I go to, say, uh, April 2022, I think I was looking for April 14th. And you can scroll through. You can see, so there's a picture taken every hour. So we have a lot of images. And you can create sort of a time-lapse routine with it. Uh, you can see there was a, there was a nudibranch on the lens a little helpful sea slug that was helping us clean off some of the, the biofouling. Uh, but you can click and, and see an animation of the images. Um, and you can see the animals go past. Um, you can also click through with the keyboard. There's a little benthocodon-like uh, uh, jellyfish floating past. Um, sea star in the background. Anyway, and you can download any of these images using this um download button at the bottom and it'll give you a little a jpeg image um and i can use the back button to go back to the screen and it'll load back up all the different cameras for me so there's there's cameras at a lot of different sites including axial seamount um, this is the International District Vent Field. And you can actually you can see uh, if you, you can see that some of the growth on the, the vent cap that we put over here. There's an instrument in here that's measuring the, the um, temperature of the fluids coming out of this vent. Um, and the there's material precipitating out covering this vent cap. But if you go back, you can see when we first deployed it, it looked a little bit different.
Next. So this is what it looked like when we first deployed it. You can see the actual vent cap underneath all of that precipitate. And you can see the currents moving back and forth. Anyway, so this is exciting because we can actually browse through the, the images now instead of having to go to the raw data archive and pull down the images individually. All right, anything that I missed, Brian? Uh, I would just add, once you find that really cool image, you can copy out the URL and send it to someone else or the page of images. Um, and you can, you know, then, you know, whoever you share that link with will we'll see the same thing. And you can also, I forgot also, there's a metadata for each image, at least for the most recent um, camera deployments, the EXIF. Uh, image metadata, so you know what make and model of camera it was and the, the settings that the images were taken at. All right, uh, and then I think I can move on to the sonar unless there's any Q&A things that I should answer. All right, put that away. The zoom buttons are interfering with my navigation. Okay. It might, so, it might uh, be useful to zoom in just a couple notches. Oh, okay. Like control plus or something. Which now has frozen my screen. Better? Yeah, that looks good. Okay. Uh, right. So uh, another new feature is the sonar. Um, so I can search, again, I can search on Sonar or I can search on ZPLS, which is the, I think, bioacoustic, the zooplankton bioacoustic sonar was the reasoning behind that code. Um, okay, so Sonar, um, I can look for the instrument type bioacoustic sonar, and I will get echogram views of each um, frequency coming from uh, these sonar instruments. So each each frequency is broken out into a separate echogram. Um, so you can see that this is the Washington shelf mooring uh, multifunction node, which is on the seafloor looking up. Um, and it'll tell you that the frequency, which direction it's facing, water depth, um, and you can see the echogram. If you want to see it larger, you can click the enlarge button and it will load that echogram. Um, and you can change the time bin. You can zoom into a feature. So you say, okay, this is interesting. There's a pretty um, strong uh, return here on this frequency. So you can zoom in on that. You can expand that zoom or focus it in using the bar on the bottom. Um, and there's a legend down here telling you what these what the colors mean on the plot. This is uh, echo range, aka depth. Um, it's a proxy for depth at this site. So this would be closer to the transducer head, so near the near the seafloor, and this is near the surface. So you can see the signal is getting a little washed out at the surface there. Um, but okay, so I've zoomed in on this feature. Um, if I decide that wasn't what I wanted to look at, you can expand the bounds to full range and go back to the original view. Um, you can change, so you can look at the um, different frequencies coming. So there's four, uh, four transducer heads looking at different frequencies here. Um, and if you zoom in, it'll, it will uh, retain that once you change frequencies. Um, and you can also see more information about the sonar here, about its location and water depth. Um, Mike, Denise yeah. Bristol has a question. Can you download just the image sequence that you want? Yes. So here you can download. So this green button down here for data downloads, you can uh, download the visual visualized time series. So what you're looking at right here, uh, the full time range, you can um, contract that and download that in that CDF format, or you can click download image and it will begin the image download. It can take a while because there's a lot of data here um, that it's compressing and sending to you. So I'll let that spin and it will send me a JPEG uh, image of this uh, echogram. Um, and you can do that uh, no matter what zoom level. So if I if I zoom in 
on this feature again. When I click download here, it will show it will download the the image that I'm looking at. So I'll start that download as well. Hopefully I'm not screwing up the system by doing two simultaneous downloads. But anyway, uh, so if I wanted to say investigate what's going on here, um, is this real? What's causing this? So there's there's some sort of strong return. Uh, this is on the 38 kilohertz, which is a pretty wide band, um, low resolution feature. Um, but you can zoom in more uh, to get. So the higher frequencies mean you're you're looking at um, smaller features, higher resolution. Um, so you can see that it looks a little different at 200 kilohertz than it does at 38 kilohertz. I'm not a sonar expert, so I don't know exactly what I'm uh, looking at here. Um, and you would need to do a net toe to see exactly what animals you might be looking at here. But you can add this to a data view. And I already created a data view here called Washington Offshore. And then click and save to data view. But you could add a new data view if you wanted. And you could add different uh, types of data to that. Um, so now if I go to the data view, so I could go here and say, OK, here's Washington Offshore. And these are the charts that I've saved. So this is the 200 kilohertz frequency that I just added, um, but I also had the 38 kilohertz. And you can see, okay, so this, I was looking from April 23rd to July 26th, uh, which is not exactly what I was looking at here. So I can change the range a little bit. Mike, while you're doing that, Michael Thorne has a question. Ish. And his question is, are those images being generated when those changes are being made or are they pre-rendered? And Michael's unmuted so he can explain further if needed. <laughs> they are pre-generated. I'll let Brian explain further if there's more uh, technical details on how these are being created. Um, I guess I would say they're not pre-generated. We pre-bin the data. So we sort of prepare the data ahead of time, and then um, the user interface requests data and draws those on the fly. So, okay. so could I, maybe I could add a couple of steps here. So the raw data is processed through um, a library called EchoPipe. That data is then sent to Data Explorer. And then as Brian just mentioned, he calculates the plotting off of that data. Uh, okay, and how about the actual image generation then? Is that done on server side or is that done in browser? It's in browser. In browser. And are you using um, sort of WebAssembly for that or are you just doing that in raw JavaScript? Uh, it's a Canvas. So we're using Canvas 2D. Um, mm -hmm. And I guess there's libraries that help, but it comes back to raw. JavaScript. We're not using web WebAssembly. Okay, cool. Thank you. Now, how do I get back to being muted? <laughs> <laughs> oh, there we go. All right. So, and Mike, one more. Yeah. Um, Eric Rim says, "Please remind us how you got to comparison chart with other parameters." And I've unmuted Eric too, if he would like to explain further. Yeah, it was just we we were looking at the sonograms and then suddenly the stuff on the left appeared and I think I just missed the transition. No, yeah, there was I I had pre-generated this uh, data view, but you could go, oh. you can go to any. So I'll go back to the home data access and I can say search for temperature. I was looking for water temperature and I can find water temperature near this sonar instrument so i what i was looking at was the washington shelf surface mooring so this is water temperature from the near surface instrument frame and you can add this data set to the data view using the uh, star icon ah uh, very good Thank and you. then once once it's added you can um add it to this comparison chart using the icons up here um so you can add and remove um different data sets from this comparison chart. Um, so I have water, I have two different water temperatures at the surface and the seafloor, and I have um, chlorophyll A, um, all from this surface mooring being compared. Um, and you can see on the map where this is located. And you'll notice I'm doing this from <clears throat> uh, uncabled sonar uh, because we, we don't have the cabled um, sonar instrument data uh, processed through 
that process that Jeff was describing yet. Um, that's uh, in progress, but we do have a number of cabled sonar uh, instruments that have pretty high density uh, real-time cabled uh, data that will be coming into the system soon. But yeah, anyway, um, I was looking to see whether there was some sort of chlorophyll signal, um, would be a proxy for photosynthetic activity that might explain why there was this huge spike in activity near the surface. Um, and there was some uh, increased water temperature during this time period, um, but I would have to do further investigations to see exactly what was going on here. Um, and I can download all these different data sets um, and see which station and sensor they're coming from. Um, that's all I was going to demo. Thanks, Mike. That was great. And Brian and Mike, there are two questions in the Q&A, if you'd like to handle those. The first one is from Saj. Okay, one feature that would be really helpful on the data view page is the ability to sync the selected time range among all graphs. Yeah, I agree. And that's something that's sort of been two steps away for a while. Maybe this will prompt it to happen. Uh, where do I see that type of what type of processing, if any, has taken place looking at sonar data? Um, I'm not sure. Do we have that? Is that under more information on the sonar graph? I don't believe so. Like on the detail page? But Jeff, the, the echo pipe code, <clears throat> is that on the OI GitHub page? I, I believe it is. Um but I think it might be good to uh, put a link here or add it uh, at, a, at a, a future date. But it is on the GitHub page, along with the echo pipe, uh, not necessarily the code, but the parameters. If you click on the series page, you might get... You want me to hand it back to you? Uh, no, that's OK. Yeah, oh, I, yeah. I, I don't. I don't think we promoted that that uh, I, this this is an enhancement. Okay. And probably we'll do it uh, as part of the uh, bringing in the RCA data. Yeah, that's a good note. And Saj has another question: Is there a way to share data views yet? Yes. Sorry, Saj, you only get one question per webinar. <laughs> yes sorry jeff was saying how to do that oh yes i think i think uh, if you go into that page it's let's literally share so there um share. far upper right yeah so that's a unique link um if mike were to share that with you you should see the exact same thing he's seeing and you can manipulate his data view, um, but it won't change his version. Or you can create your own data views on top of it. This is an excellent feature for, for classrooms. Yes, or for, so Stace originally found this uh, feature and asked me about it, Stace Bolu at Hui. Um, and so I created the, the data view to compare some of these things and then sent her the link to the data view and so she could see what I was working on. And so, yeah, that was useful as well. All right. Looking forward to doing this with the cable data soon. And just cleaning up the Q&A, Andrew, did you get the link that Stace provided? I, you're able to talk. You did, thanks. <laughs> hey, any other questions? Okay, well, we appreciate your attendance and all the feedback and the interaction. Please, as I said earlier, keep it coming. Um, we definitely uh, feel that we are user-driven and uh, feedback is the best way to do that.
Thank you much. We have one last question that you should be able to embed the links. So, yeah, there's a couple things you could do. Um, Why don't you repeat the question? That might be helpful. Uh, are we able to embed these links into another web page for teaching? Um, I would say the best way to handle that would just be to create a share link and then create a link on your web page and send people into the data explorer. Um, you could experiment with iframing the the portal. Um, we've done that before, but it's it's not necessarily the best way to display the data. And the other question is just asking what plans there might be for a one on one with an agency to promote their use of viewer data, please uh, just contact us and we can have discussions uh, off to the side. Any others? Okay, well, I think we'll wrap. And once again, thank you very much for joining.